Good to be in the house of the Lord this New Year's Eve. And I think about so many people who tonight will be killed on the roads because of drunk driving. And uh, sad to see the state of our world, but uh, sin has just got a grip on our world, on our country. I hope it doesn't have a grip on your life. There is freedom in Christ. As I said last week, God's liberty bell is not cracked. When you're in him, you're free. Thinking about drunks, I thought about this joke. I was, on my, I got to Brazil, travel, that's a long flight. And we had an 18 hour bus flight and, and a missionary told me this joke. He said, these two drunks got on a bus. And real, one was a real big guy and he sat next to the window and his friend sat next to him and they were just, you know, drunk and his friend began to get sick. And he thought, oh no, I've got to throw up. I'll have to get up and reach over him and open that window, you know, and, and stick my head out. So he got up, he couldn't get the window open. He threw up all over his friend. He thought, what on earth am I going to do? He's going to kill me. So he thought, he nudged him, he woke him up and said, I hope you feel better. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad joke. but a... Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts is a great book, the history of the church, uh, and what a, what a great book. We see so many great things. I, I love the transitional part of it that, you know, they're still going to the synagogue, and yet they're starting churches, and, and they're reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ and all the great stories, uh, a great New Testament book of stories. I love the gospels for that reason as well. But Remember, it links the synagogue and the church and law and grace, and they're still, uh, you know, abiding by the dietary laws, but yet they're learning. They have freedom to eat, and, and there's just so many great transitions in here. But here's another kind of a mini transition between uh, Philip and Stephen and Peter and Paul. Uh, Philip and Stephen were two of the seven deacons chosen uh, to take care of the Grecian widows. They were upset because the Greek-speaking uh, you know, part of the church, they, their needs weren't met. The widows were needing them. And, and so they, they uh, ended up speaking up. Some people spoke up and they chose these seven men. And Philip was one of the seven as well as Stephen, who we just talked about him being stoned. And uh, Philip was called an evangelist in chapter 21. And he certainly does evangelize. He was not the apostle Philip, uh, but the deacon Philip, the evangelist Philip, and like Stephen, which chapter 6 tells us, those seven men, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith, full of power. And now Philip's going to begin to serve the Lord as an evangelist. And, and that's the word preaching here right in the start of the text is actually the word, the word evangelism. So uh, we think of Acts chapter 8, the beginning of persecution. The Bible says there was great persecution in verse 1. You take Acts 8.1, compare it with Acts 1.8. What did Jesus say? His last words recorded in the book of Acts. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in what? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the world. And that's exactly what persecution caused to happen. So even though persecution seems to be a terrible thing, it did spread preachers all across Europe and Asia to preach the gospel. And so it was a great thing indeed uh, for the propagation of the gospel. Chapter 8, verse 4, stand if you have it. We'll read through verse 8. And those of you who can't stand, don't worry about it. By the time I'm done preaching, you won't be able to stand me either. Uh, <laughs> here we go. Therefore, now that connects, of course, verse 1 through verse 3, the persecution, they're scattering. It says in verse 1, therefore... They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Then it says, but, and of course next week we'll look at what happens. The devil's always there, isn't he, to take our joy away. God bless us as we take a look in the book for a walk in the world. And God, we want to glean something that we can apply to our lives. Help us, Lord, not to be just hearers this morning, but doers. 
we thank you for the fact that you could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. And I, I remember, Lord, the great memories of Maranatha Campground and Hilding Helverson and the chalk artist Steele singing and drawing and then that great memory. And it reminds me of the fact that you could, could have called 10,000 angels, but instead, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. Bless us now as we uh, study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Hopefully they can get chapter 11, verse 19 on the screen. But in verse 4, we see the mention of Samaria. And there was a, an area of Samaria and there was a city of Samaria. And we're just going to talk about it in the general terms today. But here uh, we know that uh, besides Samaria, and according to chapter 11, verse 19, they went to several other cities. Uh, these Grecians went to Samaria, and they also went, according to chapter 11, to Phenica. Remember, that's the home of Jezebel. At that time, it was a city of 500,000 people. Uh, they went also to Antioch, which was the third largest city uh, to minister, to spread the gospel. And Seleucia, which would replace kind of Jerusalem as the hub of, of evangelism and mission, the missionary movement of that day. And of course, we know that the gospel just spread, and persecution helped spread the gospel. In fact, I find it interesting, Lebanon, which, you know, we use the word Christian loosely, but that's still considered a Christian country between Syria and Israel. Now, as far as are these Christian people born again, according to Scripture, I don't know, but they classify themselves as Christian. So the gospel had really spread around the world, and all over this north of, of, uh, of Jerusalem. And we know the Bible says here in verse 4, uh, therefore, they're scattered. And Philip went down to Samaria. Now, we say down when we know Samaria was north geographically. But remember, the Jews always considered everything from the elevation of the holy city. And so everything was down compared to that city on a hill. And the city on a hill, of course, we know is, is a wonderful city. And one day the Lord will return. And we believe he'll rule the world from, the, from Jerusalem. And so here uh, it says he went down to Samaria. And the Samaritans, as you know, you know this, were half Assyrian, half Jewish people. In 722, when the Assyrians came in and took over the area, brutal, brutal people, a lot of them settled in the area of Samaria, in that area which became known as Samaria. And they intermarried with the Jewish women, and they were hated, hated by the Jews. And we know that, uh, so Philip goes up there to preach. And we know these Jewish, uh, con we call them uh, Jews, I mean they're Samaritan Jews who built their own temple. They only accepted the Pentateuch. And we know they didn't interact with the Jews. In fact, uh, it's interesting as you study history, we find in, in 2 Kings eleven nineteen. great, he's got it up there that the Assyrians actually sent a lot of Assyrians to stay in the area to control the country. They would just infiltrate and stay. And we know that even today, the Muslims now, one of the things the Muslims will tell you is we're infiltrating. We're sending people, and our people have 10 kids. They've taken over Deborn, Michigan. Deborn, they've taken over, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paris. More than half is Muslim. And, and uh, they're just learning to take over by outnumbering people. And, and certainly that, that uh, is something that's happening today. But that's what they did way back when the Assyrians sent people to Israel. John said the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Of course, that's in John 4 when Jesus stunned them by routing through Samaria and talking to a Samaritan woman. She was even shocked. But we know that uh, James and John in Luke chapter 9, I thought it's interesting, another passage. Thanks for having that up there, Kenneth. In Luke 9, remember, uh, the Samaritans rejected Jesus Christ. They didn't want anything to do with him. They, had no, they, they wouldn't receive him. And James and John said, should we uh, call for fire from heaven to consume them? Pretty easy to consume and, and judge people you don't like. I mean, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans to begin with. And I just thought about that. Years ago, I was at a preacher's conference, and I was very frustrated. I've never gone back to one since. And a guy got up, and he said, I wish California would just open up and swallow all those fags, and said a lot of things like that from the pulpit. And uh, as much as I don't like sin, 
as much as I don't like sodomy, as much as Scripture speaks against it, we're not like Jesus in that regard when we say things and think things like that. Because what did he say to James and John here when they said, shall we just burn them up? He said, I came, the Son of Man, referencing himself, the great title, the great incarnation title, came to what? Seek and to save that which was lost. And so our attitude of wanting to burn everybody and kill everybody who is a sinner, uh, we want to apply it to all those people we see as perverted. And I believe there is perversion. There's no doubt about it. But we still need to remember, I said Wednesday night, the Lord doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. God still cares for sinners. I love that about God. Amen. And you say, well, preacher, you know, I, I, you know, I hate that sin. I, I understand that. We hate sin. It's good to hate sin. Somehow we have to be like Jesus when it comes to sinners. And he loved them. And he reached out to them. We find him with the woman caught in adultery. And we find so many other Bible passages where he is compassionate with people who we would say do not deserve compassion. And so we know he came to seek and to save. And that should be our desire. And that was his response. And... Uh, I was reading something this week I thought was interesting. In 1829, it's an old story, a man named George Wilson was arrested for robbery and murder in a mail heist. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death by hanging. Some friends intervened and went all the way to President Andrew Jackson. And when told of this, Wilson refused to accept the pardon. Jackson pardoned him. He said, no, I don't deserve that pardon. I'd rather die. And he died. Sad story, but the president said we can't make him accept a pardon. If he doesn't accept it, it's invalid. You know, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Amen. The wages of sin is death. But if you're here today and you've never accepted the pardon, it's not going to do you any good. The fact that he shed his blood and died for you, there's no power in that pardon if you don't receive it. This man died, and he deserved to die. I deserve to die because of my sin just as much as the sodomites. Did you know that? Well, I never committed that sin. Don't ever intend to. But I received the grace and mercy of God. I love that about God. And I love it that he's merciful to me. And so... In the case of the Samaritan woman, you see Samaritans three times. We, we just recently studied Luke 17, the grateful Samaritan, 10 lepers, only one comes back, the grateful Samaritan. And I know, I think I preached here a few years ago, the good Samaritan, what a great story. That Jewish man is beat up and the religious people pass him up, but a good Samaritan comes along. And the woman at the well, of course, the guilty Samaritan had all these men she'd been with and was living with a man. And I love that story. Uh, but in each of those cases, we see, especially with the, the Samaritan woman, the grace of God, the grace of God, that he reaches way down for sinners, and he reaches way down for me. And I love that, that he saves uh, each and every one of us that call, call unto him and repent of our sin. But anyway, here Philip is preaching Christ, it says. Now, what would he preach, Pastor? The New Testament wasn't completed. He was preaching from the Old Testament, we know that, and he was pointing out all the prophecies that have been fulfilled. All these prophecies. And Jesus Christ fulfilled every prophecy about the Messiah in the Old Testament. It's fascinating. And he was preaching like Stephen in the Old Testament. Now, we don't have his sermon like we did with Stephen. We just know he was preaching. And we were certain he referenced those scriptures as well. And we have to say today, we, we also reference those scriptures today. I mean, the Old Testament is just so wonderful. I, I just love as we look at the pattern and things unfold and the types and everything points to Jesus Christ. Hundreds of prophecies. And I quite often use in, in exchanging my thoughts when I witness to someone who says they don't believe in God, I'll, I'll talk about so many of the things that uh, cause us to marvel, you know, um, you know, I was thinking about the circumcision on the eighth day, and you know this, you're smart people, but, 
how did the Bible know it would be the eighth day that the vitamin K, the clotting, begins? Because the Bible is inspired. God breathed and told Moses what to write. Modern cleansing. How did Moses know it was running water? John Hopkins read his Bible and said, well, if it's running water, I need to change the way we wash. We wash in a bowl. And he discovered all those cleansing things. And we could go on and on. My point is this. The answers are here. The Word of God is here. We trust it. And here's Philip preaching the Old Testament and saying to the Jews, this is the Messiah. This is the one, the one you've waited for. And the Greek-speaking Jews and the other Jews would hear it and and uh, the Bible says, with one accord, verse 6, they'd give heed to those things which Philip spake. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That had a big part as well. The miracles is, is really the Greek word we get our word signs from. Signs always pointed to something. And of course, remember in that day there were a lot of signs and miracles yet. We believe by faith. Uh, I would love to always have a sign. I'd love to always have a miracle. I'd love to trust a fleece, but it just hasn't been that way for me. It's been the peace of God. Amen. Now, the Bible said, let the peace of God rule. We get our actual word umpire from that. Did you know God guides you from his word and with peace? If you're expecting something, it may not happen for you. You know, I wish God had given me a sign a few times in my life. Sometimes even now I pray and say, Lord, give me a sign. Doesn't work that way. We trust him. Amen. Even when it's not good, we trust him, don't we? And so they saw the signs, and the Bible says they took heed. I love that. They were following you know, the Word and obeying the Word, and they'd seen the miracles. And here he's, the Bible says they'd seen the signs. Verse 7, it says, For unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that possessed with them. Wow, what a, what a revival this is. I mean, people are being delivered from demon possession. Demons had control of people. And let me say this to you. A demon cannot possess the body of a believer. The Holy Spirit resides in there. It's his temple. And greater is he that is in you. And so you don't have to fear demon possession. There been times I thought, man, I get so mad at my kids. I thought, is the devil in me or what? And I thought, I'm going to beat them till I beat the devil out of them. Uh, I don't mean beat them, but spank them. But... You know, there's challenges in life, and we see sometimes in our sinful nature, we think, man, that was terrible of me. You ever just done something rotten and you're so ashamed of yourself? Well, he doesn't possess you. That's your flesh. Years ago, a lady said, oh, I have this demon, and my husband has that demon. I said, you don't have demons in you if you're believers. The works of the flesh are these. And it's just your flesh doing what it likes to do. And so here we see the unclean, clean, that, you know, that word catheter. It says that they, they were dirty. They didn't have cleanliness. And then it says many were healed of palsies. We get our word paralyzed from that, but that's, that doesn't mean they're all paralyzed, but they had palsies. And, and then the healing, the therapy is the word here. And I, I love the, the way God healed. There's so many different miracles, miraculous stories we talk about on Wednesdays, and some were gradual. Um, my shoulder's been gradual. Uh, the therapy has been consistent, and I don't like going to therapy. I, my secretary gets kicked out of it. She says, don't forget your therapy like I need to be reminded. And, and when I come back, I always act like it's been torture, but it's really not been that bad, okay? But we understand. But God, when he healed, he healed completely. He healed completely. Amen. Nobody needed to go to therapy after God was done healing. I, I, they didn't need surgery. God, no doubt, we're thankful for our, our medical personnel. I mean, Dr. Luke, I'm certain, was appreciative and treated people. But God healed. And, and I, I love the fact that he, he heals us spiritually. He saves us and puts our lives back together. And while he may heal you physically, that's wonderful. He may not. And, and just be like Paul and say, well, I, I just accept it, Lord. Sometimes we just have to accept our health problems accept our circumstances. The poor person prays for years for God to give them money, to give them a good job, and sometimes the prayer is never answered. The sick person, some may pray all the time. The person with a wayward child may pray for years and never see that child come back to the Lord. But we trust him. 
And we don't lean onto our own understanding. We just trust him. And that's hard. But the blessing that comes with trust is pretty spectacular because you can lay down at night and know everything's going to be okay. It may not be okay, but it's going to be okay. And when God works everything to good, I heard David Jeremiah this morning, great message. He's talking about God working everything together for good. Doesn't mean everything is good, but God takes everything that he needs and pieces it together for his honor and glory. Amen. And we trust him. We trust him. And so here uh, we say the belief that believers are possessed with the greatest power. The person in you is God in the spirit. And you don't need to fear possession. What you need to do is obey the Lord's leadership in your life. In verse seven, unclean spirits, verse eight, and there was great joy. We talked about joy last week, the different types of joy. David lost his joy because of sin. So many Christians are like that. Uh, the fruit of the spirit, joy. My question is, here was great joy, previously great persecution, great lamentation when Stephen died. And now we, we have to ask the question, what brings you joy? What brings you joy in your life? I'm going to read you something else. This is interesting because I knew who this guy was. Pat Summerall spent 50 years with the NFL, National Football League. <clears throat> he was drafted by the Detroit Lions in 52. He played with the Chicago Cardinals and the New York Giants in the 60s. After his retirement from the game, he joined CBS as a broadcaster. And in 93, sit switched to Fox News. During his CBS years, he and a fellow broadcasters broadcaster partied hard off the field. He said, we raised Cain. I don't know where he'd find that grave, but he raised Cain. I was the first guy at the bar, he said, and the last to leave. Summerall was told that if he kept on drinking, he was going to die. After checking himself into, into Betty Ford Clinic, his counselor urged him to seek a better life through faith. And at 66 years old, he was baptized, saved and baptized. And he said, he testified, I just became a Christian. I can't tell you how great my life has been since then. Don't you love that story? Amen. What, what brings you joy? Is it a, a, a new possession? Is it investing your pension? I know people that work all their life for things, the things the world has to offer. And they get all done and they find out it's just all vanity. I have a preacher friend, Ed Gibson. He preaches a message called Soap Bubbles. And he talks about all the things that look so pretty and we really want those things like a kid seeing a soap bubble. And when he reaches, he pops it, he finds out it's empty. Do you know what? The things of this world just bring emptiness. They bring emptiness. If you think that you had a million dollars, you'd be happier than you are now. You'd be happier for a temporary time. And then you'd just go back to the same old insecurities and fears that you had before. You'd still have problems. You'd still have a, an old nature to deal with. You'd still have health issues because that stuff never satisfies. Solomon said that stuff doesn't satisfy. It doesn't meet that internal need that you have for joy. And joy comes as a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. When I get discouraged, I pick up my church directory and I say, do I need to visit someone? This, this week I went and visited someone. I thought, here, I'm discouraged. I'll visit someone. They need encouragement. You know what that does for me? It gives me joy. I'm not thinking about myself anymore. I'm thinking about others. And I'm thinking about doing something that the Lord would appreciate me doing. Sin robs you of joy. What brings you joy? There's joy in the presence of angels. It doesn't say angels are rejoicing and singing and all that. It says there's joy in the presence of angels when one sinner comes to Christ. If we really had joy about the things of the work of God, we'd be out witnessing more. We'd be out giving more. If we really believed in, in, in heaven and the riches of heaven, boy, we'd be reaching people, witnessing, doing all kinds of stuff to reach people. The problem was our faith is limited by our own sinful choices. 
And the enemy, as we mentioned earlier, here we find Simon the sorcerer, and next week we'll talk about him. He's always waiting to oppose the work of God. When you have joy, or when God gives you some sort of victory, or a prayer is answered for a while, man, you're just flying high. But the enemy says, oh, I got a plot, a trap for him. I've got to do something. I mean, in my life in ministry, I've seen one blessing after another answered, a prayer in church things and people's lives. But as soon as that thing happens, the devil comes along and throws something else right in your face. He's always at work. He's going to and fro. And his angels are, are going to and fro and trying to disrupt the word of God. And so we have to live by faith and trust him moment by moment. I don't just need the Lord when I get up here and preach. I need the Lord every moment of my day. Every moment of my life. And I have to be in constant prayer. As soon as I have a blessing or a victory, the enemy comes. The word synergy is, is a, a word I had to look it up this morning to be able to spell it right, but it's the word in Romans chapter 12. How God works things together. And in my life, I have seen so many times God work things together. Sometimes I haven't understood and I haven't agreed with God. Sometimes I say, God, why do you do it? Why are you doing this? Job's wife, just curse God and die. We don't understand in this life, but we will one day understand how he works things together. I've told you stories of my dad losing his job. We went from having a boat in Grand Haven and a nice house in Lake Michigan and a camper and all these things to in Lansing. But God had a plan. It was a special youth leader, a special college leader when I went to junior college up there. It was my pastor and what God would do spiritually and all my siblings met their spouses in that area. God had a plan. We don't sometimes see it and we don't even sometimes give God glory for it, but God is still sovereign. Amen. And he's sovereign not only in America and the world, he's sovereign in your life. And we need to yield moment by moment to his leadership in our life. Obey the scriptures. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Lord, if anyone is here without peace, help them to keep their minds stayed on you. Perfect peace they can have, Lord, with that relationship with you. But if someone today doesn't have peace, help them, Lord, to examine their life. Maybe they don't know the God of peace, the Prince of Peace. Maybe... Father, they don't know you through your son, Jesus Christ. Maybe they've never been born again. Maybe, maybe they're a Christian who just hasn't ever said, Lord, hear my sin me. I yield my body to you. I, I give it all to you. And maybe it's a brother that, or sister that hasn't done that. You know what? I've been preaching constantly on Sunday mornings, addressing this matter of people who go to church and think they're Christians for the wrong reasons. And God, I just pray that you'll just deal with hearts, not only today, but every time we meet and gather to worship you. We bless, ask you to bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.